Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Glustick channel, one of the most fearsome and justifiably famous undead monsters from Dungeons and Dragons world is the Lich. The word Lich is Old English for corpse, and the monster developed from early fantasy fiction writers who depicted evil sorcerers who could use their magic to hold death at bay or even return from the dead. Gary Gygax, one of the co-creators of Dungeons and Dragons, stated that he based the description of the Lich included in the game on the short story The Sword of the Sorcerer, written by Gardner Fox in 1969, but H.P. Lovecraft used the word in one of his stories in 1937, and in 1891 Ambrose Bierce wrote about a Lich in his story The Death of Halp and Fraser. It has a great passage in it about the nature of the Lich. <clears throat> for by death is wrought greater change than hath been shown, whereas in general the spirit that removeth cometh back upon occasion, it is sometimes seen in those in flesh appearing in the form of the body it bore, yet it hath happened that the veritable body without the spirit hath walked, and it is attested of those encountering who have lived to speak thereon that a lich so raised up hath no natural affection, nor remembrance thereof, but only hate. Also it is known that some spirits which in life were benign become by death evil altogether. A truly gothic story, that one. In this video, I'll talk about how a lich is made, what sort of tradition this magic comes from. I'll talk about the rituals of what happens, the experience of becoming the lich and being a lich, and the motivations and activities of liches, and the variants of lich kind and the so-called good liches. I will talk about the true power of the lich and the right ways to run an encounter with them in a game or story. I'll also talk about some of the most famous liches and even possibly pay a character liches. No, probably not. Maybe that I'll, I'll save that for another um, video. So settle back, adventure, stay a while and listen, and we're going to explore the lore of the lich. First of all, a lich is an undead creature. It does not breathe, it doesn't eat, sleep, or have any normal biological process. It is an enduring, fully aware, fully autonomous soul, trapped in its own corpse, sustained by its willpower, arcane magic, and occasionally the souls of other beings who fuel its supernatural longevity. It is deathless, but failure to feed souls into its profane magical anchor to the material world will cause its corpse to decay even further, and eventually the rotting will wear it away until it's only a skull, um, a vestige, a, uh, a shriveled husk. Despite having dead flesh and rotting organs, it can still see, it can hear, and it can move about, and it can talk. But the voice is more magical than physical. For example, a lich can speak underwater. It requires no air to do so. The focal point of the magic that animates them is called a phylactery. It can take many forms, but we uh, will always include a small script of symbols written on a piece uh, length of fabric. Not always, but in modern liches it does. Or it's engraved into a locket of some such, such as um, a gemstone or an amulet or a ring or such. These symbols are essentially a contract with otherworldly powers in most cases, and the origins of the particular binding magic lies in the history of the creation of another form of undead, the mummy. But there is a, a more than one way to create a lich, and one of which has been described in great detail in Dragazine, Dragon Magazine uh, two, number 26, published in 1979. And this is an article written by Len Lakofka, The Blueprint of a Lich, which is a superb article, only a page long, but I'll try to condense it down even more for you. Keep in mind, uh, other ways to create a lich exist, and this is just one of the more common ways that was researched and performed by arcane spellcasters. To begin the path for attaining lichdom, an aspiring lich must be a spellcaster in class capable of casting 6th level or higher spells. The knowledge of lichdom is usually a well-guarded secret. This is, uh, there is a potion involved in this ritual, and I'd have to say that's one of the more horrific things about the whole process. Here is a list of the ingredients, in the exact order that they are added together, under the light of a full moon, and the entire potion must be consumed in one go. And I assume this ritual is taking place in the lich's lair, or someplace which is steeped in um, dark energy, such as a graveyard or a, a place where a massacre has taken place. Two pinches of pure arsenic are followed by a pinch of belladonna, a measure of fresh face spider venom, no more than 30 days old, a measure of fresh wyvern venom, no more than 60 days old, the blood of a dead humanoid infant killed by a face spider, the blood of a dead humanoid infant killed by a mixture of arsenic and belladonna, that's at least 340 milliliters or 11.5 fluid ounces of blood by the way, 
The heart of a virgin humanoid killed by a woman's venom. One quart of blood from a vampire, or at the very least a person who has been infected by the curse of vampirism. The more potent the vampire, the better the potion's overall efficacy. And the ground-up reproductive glands of six giant moths who have been dead for no more than 60 days. This is all mixed up and thankfully concentrated down into one noxious brew. The ingredients... The potion's ingredients must be consumed within one week of the period of the phylactery being an active and able to receive a soul. Due to the ingredients used, the potion is generally not prepared very far ahead of time. Acquiring fresh phase spider venom and wyvern venom is not an easy thing to do, and it takes a lot of planning, not to mention gathering together a bunch of baby infants. Integral to this process are the spells Magic Jar, Trap the Soul, and Enchant Item. I've included some of the links to these spells in the description down below. Trap the Soul is a sorcerer and wizard spell that allows the caster to trap the life force and material body, if any, of a creature inside a gem, usually a very expensive gem, to hold the power of the high-level spellcaster's soul. The creature can only be released if the gem is broken. The spell is attributed to the Netherese Arcanist, Death Ed in uh, minus, 180, uh, minus 1883 DR and is originally known as Death Ed's Trap. The enchanted item transforms the object into a masterwork quality, if not already, and then adds a plus one enchantment bonus for every three caster levels. Magic Jar allows the soul to leave the object, traveling up to 100 feet and possessing a humanoid's body. With a combination of these spells primed and ready, the arcanist then prepares a few things. First, the phylactery in this instance is a solid object with at least a couple of thousand gold pieces of value in it. It is enchanted to be of masterwork quality and it can have other enchantments on it, but cannot be made of wood. The arcanist casts the trap the soul spell into the object and then goes into the object. This process is vicious and extremely draining. Once the arcanist comes back out of the object, they need to rest up for a week. During that time, they essentially have a magical hangover of epic proportions and can't cast the top three levels of spells that they normally could. So they're, they're weakened, they're drained by this. Um, you could say that they have exhaustion levels. The phylactery is pr now primed and ready, so they consume the potion. I should mention here that there's a chance that doing this will end up killing them outright, so they are likely to have some assistant on hand in case they need to be brought back to life. It would be prudent of them to have access to a wish spell before they begin as well, because they can have some particularly devastating and debilitating effects from drinking that noxious brew. It would be prudent to um, have wish spells, but not necessarily. Um, it would be available to them. After drinking the potion, they have uh, royally disrupted their entire being on a fundamental level, but it's not immediately apparent to anyone around them that they are now prepared for lichdom. Only that, um, not only that, but there's this particular special effect caused by the phylactery itself, um, in so much that it cannot be magically located. Even a god who ha um, has the ability to see an entire plane, has to be within 100 miles of it to actually sense the exact location of the flat tree. Ordinary spellcasters and divi diviners have not got a clue, and the potential lich cannot be compelled to reveal its, uh, the flat tree's location, even if it's been magically charmed. That's the whole point of the flat tree, is to secure and hide away the lich's soul after all. So yeah, they, the Lich can be compelled to tell what the phylactery is, what it looks like, every detail about it. They can just be, never be compelled to tell you where it is. The next time the potion drinker dies, their soul automatically goes into the jar, into the soul jar, the phylactery. No matter the distance or the obstacles in between, the soul still goes in there. To get out again, they must have a body, any body, that's within 90 feet of the phylactery in order to try and possess it with their soul. This is not an automatic process, but it's easier if the creature is only small or modest um, in its amount of hit points that it had in life. This is one reason you don't see loads of liches possessing giant monster white bodies. Um, the body can have been dead for no longer than 30 days. This presents all sorts of logistical problems for the lich, but more on that in a moment. Also, this corpse is really just a vehicle. The lich really needs to get back into its own body to regain its full power. The standby corpse raises up as a white containing the soul of the lich. If the creature could cast any spells in life, then the lich can use that body to cast spells, but only up to fourth level spells, no more. And the white can't um, drain energy from the living as a normal white could. The white lich then goes off in search of its own original body. 
which it can find as though it has a permanent locate object spell emanating from it. When the Lich's original body is found, they will transport it back to the location of their phylactery and transfer back into it. The white, now spent, is disposed of. But it's very hard to totally destroy the Lich's corpse thanks to that potion. Even if it's burnt to ash, the white will simply eat the ash and transform physically into the original body about a week later. A disintegration spell is required to truly destroy the original Lich body, forcing the Lich to remain a white unless it can find someone to cast a wish spell to return their original corpse to them. Could they use a wish to return to living form? No, the potion is a one-way trip to abomination. There are significant drawbacks as a spellcaster to being a lich. Um, we'll talk about some of those in, in a minute. Because the lich is dead, it can't recover from the taxing drain it experiences every time it's forced to go back inside its phylactery. Every time it does so, it effectively loses a level. And if it drops down to below level 10, it can never leave the phylactery again once it's killed. It's become a permanent resident. Now, no doubt you notice that these limitations don't seem to exist for the modern lich, and that the most common form of phylactery is not a solid metal or gemstone object, it's a sealed metal box with strips of parchment on which magical phrases have been transcribed. Well, there's a good reason for that. Creation of this sort of phylactery is far more expensive in components and time, costing around 120000 thousand gold pieces. Also, this kind of transformation ritual is derived from the ancient necromantic process of creating a mummy. The magical um, phrases on the strips of parchment are basic, basically contracts with powerful forces of evil, such as Vecna, Orcus, Pale Knight, Atropus, or any number of demon lords. And the common denominator is that they lay claim to the soul of the lich once it dies. This, however, is manipulated by the incantation because the Lich sells off its soul to more than one master, gaining benefits from each and pitting them against each other in a kind of spiritual tug of war. This allows the Lich to keep its hold on its soul instead of moving on to the afterlife. It is effectively dispossessed and now has an open conduit to the negative energy plane. This is not, I should add, a pleasant state to be in, as its existence and its living on a precipice of a long terrible fall into hell and what's more a hell where the power you bargain with is really really angry at being toyed with some powers are more reasonable than others however for instance orcus is fine with granting lichdom as long as the lich works to create as many undead as it can and victim will simply give the lich the occasional target that needs to be murdered mutilated or destroyed no questions asked it is a difficult existence, and liches typically compensate for their tenuous state of being by gaining as much magical knowledge and power as they can, convinced, as always, that they can always figure out a more adv advantageous and permanent solution to any problem. That's the hubris of the intellect of the spellcaster. There are also different forms of lich. The Alhoon is an illithid or mind flayer lich. They have obtained freedom from the control and uh, hive mind connection to the elder brain, but are hated by other mind flayers and almost universally hunted by other races. Devout clerics of the god Bane can be slowly transformed into undead, undead servants of the god of tyranny. As these Bane liches grow older, they, they uh, increase their powers until they are just as powerful as any other lich. There are, of course, the Draca liches, dragons transformed into liches via the arcane ritual created by the archwizard and lich, Samasta. Um, I've got a video about them, and I've also got a video which talks about famous witches, wizards, including Samasta, so if you want to check back through the records. Liches can evolve beyond their current state and become a demi-lich, where they have learned all they could learn from their studies and sought to travel out into the multiverse. They no longer need to be continually tied to a body. The lich learns the art of creating soul gems and replaces eight small pieces of its body with them. This is why they typically have eye sockets with these gemstones in them, and usually replace some of their teeth with them. But they could also become joints of a hand or discs in the lich's spine. Once the power of the lich is focused in one part of the body, the rest of the skeleton crumbles away, and it's now free to move about. This part remains um, and contains the soul gems, the eight gems acting as the demi-lich's phylacteries, um, and this transformation grants them extraordinary resistance to the magic of others, almost total spell immunity, although they are vulnerable to spells such as shatter and things like that. There are a lot more, um, they're a lot more mobile and dangerous, and they, um, they are more active than the reclusive lich who relies on its hidden phylactery. And after many, many years of arcane study, they have a very deep understanding of magic and they're usually up and mobile for a reason. So they're, go they're going on some quest that their studies have compelled them to follow. So they're, they're very dangerous and focused. 
Quite a few of the more famous liches are actually demi liches, such as Aseric, um, Al Sigard, the maker, the Netherese wizards named Ander and Walrith, uh, Kangax, Ramak, and one of the famous emperors of the Shun Empire. One of the founders of Fey, the former Zolkir Zath's Bovar, was also a demi lich. Now, before we go into more detail on the mindset and activities of evil liches, I would be remiss not to talk about the good liches, the Ark Lich and the Bale Norn, which I um, missed talking about in my original lich video, which this is updating. First, the Ark Lich. The choice of undeath, using basically exactly the same rituals taken by good aligned people out of a profound and total sense of duty and self-sacrifice to an ideal, a community, a holy order or some such. The choice to embrace undeath is allowed and considered only on rare occasions, when a clan or settlement has need of law keepers or defenders beyond the norm. Sustained in Definitely by magic, archliches appear largely as they did in life, though an immediate clue is that to its undead nature is that they appear to be shriveled and like wrinkled up, turning slightly translucent over time. I mean, they, they're dead. Um, unlike the evil liches, whose flesh and organs eventually rot to the point that they're completely gone, this arc lich has a limited extent of degeneration. They do not have the option to become demi liches, or at least that's never occurred thus far. But yeah, they generally don't rot away to nothing. Examples of arch liches are Lady Alethine Moonstar of Waterdeep, Rorgilith the Aegis, Ageless, uh, Lady Saharel, Renwick Cara Dune, and a particular dwarven arch lich named Banderil Dumathir, who transformed into an arch lich. His skin became grey like rock, his beard became like stalactites, and his irises shone like emeralds. So he's a particularly dwarven type of lich. This is particularly cool, and I fully encourage you to give some sort of spectacular clue that this undead creature that the players face is different from other undead. Perhaps it smells like fresh rain and spring blossoms, or its eyes remain forever unspoiled, looking fresh and and alive. Perhaps it wears a mask and otherwise just appears very thin and moves like a little bit differently. Or of course its voice is still very weird and it doesn't emanate from the creature um, unless uh, because it's got useless vocal cords and motionless lungs. Um, so that can be kind of weird that you're looking at something that seems to be telepathically communic communicating with you almost. The elven liches are called Bale Norns, and they are also motivated by duty to carry on beyond death, defending the clan and holdings for centuries. Most come from a spell casting background, and the method of becoming a Bale Norn uses high elven magic, or a divine ritual. Less fortunate Balnorns store their souls in a phylactery, like other liches. In some cases, Balnorns do not need to use phylacteries, as their undeath was gifted to them by the Seldarine. But these Balnorns are much more uncommon. I think it's happened one, like three to five times in 5,000 years. So the Seldarine are the basically the elven court in the Feywild. They look like Elven arch liches, and of all the uh, the all of the liches of good alignment, have the ability to paralyze a mortal by touching them, putting into an, them into a state of suspended animation that appears like death to others without the medical skill to know otherwise. The Shrin Shrin uh, Shrin Shi was no doubt the most famous Baelnorn of all time. She was the senior. Kor Sekiratar, Wind Norn of the Vault of Ages and the Lore Norn for the Armathors of the Court of Mag uh, Court Magi. Um, she helped raise the Mythal over Mithranor in 261 DR, and although at the time I believe she had revived herself and was in the mortal form of a 300 year old elven woman. So that's kind of interesting, and is that um, they have the ability to actually raise themselves from the dead. I mean, the spellcasters and things, um, particularly uh, the holy spellcasters. There was also a single instance where a clan of green elves, woodland dwellers, were wiped out by a green dragon named Venomin in, Venom in Handler in 249, uh, minus 249 DR. The last survivors were allowed by the ruling elven court uh, to become Baelnorn, but this transformation was unusual. It might have been because they were green elves, or it might have just been the circumstance. Their skin turned into petrified wood, their hair into moss, and their eyes to amber. They lost all ability to speak and had no magical powers. Instead, they became great warriors bound to the veil of lost voices, actually able to teleport around instantly within the lost veil. So I would say that some of the most infamous liches in Dungeons and Dragons history are, of course, Vecna. I have a video on him. His former servant and now infamous lich in his own right, Serac. 
who travels the multiverse creating death trap dungeons and releasing untold horror horrors on the mortal worlds samasta the former chosen of mistra who became evil and created the ritual for creating uh draco liches who later became a lich himself and was subsequently destroyed you can even include Cassus, who existed for some time as a lich-like being after the fall of netheril due to his arrogance and greed the list of liches across all media, not just Dungeons and Dragons, is large. It's a very compelling monster type that's been um, co-opted into all sorts of fiction and stories and video games. So I'll include a link to a wiki page uh, below listing a horde of famous liches for you. So what's it like to en encounter one of these things? Well, they're not nice. With a challenge rating of 21, the lich is one of the most famous and dangerous foes a player can face in the game. They are not only very powerful on their own they always always have a large force of undead and evil creatures in service to them the lich will sacrifice all of its servants and minions before it engages in any sort of physical confrontation they may elect to flee rather than ever get into melee combat with anyone they are undy undying and extremely patient some liches have even been known to simply wait for a mortal to foe to die of old age uh, they might leave an encounter with a chilling promise delivered back over their shoulder that after the mortal's flesh has rotted from their bones in the grave, the lich will ensure that every member of the mortal's family will soon join them in their graves for the insolence of disturbing it in its lair. They are highly intelligent with an in-depth knowledge of magic. They certainly set traps all through their lair and every approach to it, including misdirectional spells that will take any teleporting character and rematerialize them above drops into spiked pits. In fact, using any magic in a lich's lair is prone to have them mess with it because they are arch wizards. They can, they can manipulate magic flow within their their domain so the weave will be disrupted and your spells may do unusual things i suggest finding some um random table of random spell magical effects and making use of that anytime somebody rolls under like a five on a, on a hit roll with a, a magical spell they will have uh ledges that are lined with skeleton arches they will have animated furniture they will have exploding glyphs they will have set up summoning circles and protection circles in case they need to be uh, standing there when the zombies filled with alchemical fire leap from the ceiling onto hot braziers they will create walls of stone that they can traverse like floating bridges over chasms and dispel if anyone uh, tries to cross after them they will conceal bodax inside of shadow demons release swarms of crawling claws at any cleric that dares to try and turn dead in its presence they will have captive gelatinous cubes summoned imps contracted to serve them they will have mortal necromancers who study the scraps of the lich's research in exchange for fanatical loyalty Creatures of undeath are drawn to the lich as it is a font of necrotic power. They shine like the warm noonday sun to the undead who bask in it and are empowered by the negative energy which spells um, and spills out of the lich constantly empowering him. To the living this manifests in a resistance to turning magic. They have advantage on all saves versus turn undead and they can paralyze a mortal with a touch and release a burst of necrotic energy that disrupts life in a 20 foot area. It's one of the most devastating attacks. They are immune to disease, um, potions, uh, poison, and damage from non-magical weapons. They cannot be frightened or charmed. They have resistance to all cold, lightning, and necrotic damage. They can use legendary resistance three times per day to just shrug off any kind of saving throw. They can frighten creatures within 10 feet with a simple gaze attack. They also have true sight out to 120 feet, so they're very hard to sneak up on. They are pretty tough and leathery with an armor class of 17, usually around 135 hit points, unaltered by any magical armor or anything like that, which they may be wearing. They can most certainly use weapons, and they will always be something magical. However, they can't use magic items that require the touch of a living creature. They can't attune to them or make use of any potion. Of course, their spell knowledge is their strongest asset, though, and they can use their um, up to ninth level spells. The ninth level spell, Power Word Kill, for instance. They also have many options for tactical spell use, and it's impossible for me to describe every scenario, but they will probably attempt to dominate enemies they, um, and then run them right into the meat grinder of its lethal minions, or they'll seek to kill any divine spellcasters as quickly as possible and normally they will switch to spells and effects that hamper movement of a foe as soon as they fail to dominate it or kill it outright with ranged spell damage so the closer you get into a, a lich the, it'll change tactics on you of course the players have to deal with this as well as hordes of undead 
um, other lower level spellcasters and ranged attacks, difficult and potentially damaging terrain, and whatever other distractions and stresses the Lich has set them up with. The Lich may most certainly make use of a captured family or party member, some arcane um, contraption about to slice off limbs, balefully t- polymorph or otherwise murder kill the victim, or just other distractions that sh- and that shield um, itself from any potential physical harm. Lich was, well, they will have multiple means of escape, including plane shift, a zombie drake flying mount, a flying carpet or some such. And they'll usually flee to a familiar location to them and wait for danger to pass. And this place will be trapped up to the wazoo as well, but probably without as many minions. Certainly a lot of undead minions, but um, without the living ones there and without its um, summoned imp familiars and things. Remember, the Lich is an apex of the evil wizard. They are supposed to be damned dangerous and a very real threat to the life of the player characters. The Lich periodically needs to sacrifice mortal life and drain the soul into its phylactery to help keep its body from decaying too so um, badly, so it's certainly a reason to travel into one of their lairs if um, that victim happens to be a person of interest to the player characters. Of course, there is a very good chance the players have only managed to feed their character sheets into a paper shredder. Never nerf the Lich. Thank you very much for listening. If you have any suggestions um, or questions or fun anecdotes about liches, please let me know in the comment section below. I always strive to read them and have a pretty good track record of um, replying to them. If you've not already, please consider joining our community in the dedicated Discord server. Link below. Come have a chat. If you wish to see the full script for this video along with many others and have priority on any requests you may have for future monster videos, please consider becoming a patron of the channel on Patreon. Link down below. Again, thank you very much for listening. I'll be back again soon, as always, with more monster lore for you.